Uh, I few people would uh, uh, argue with the fact that transparency and participation are some of the new buzzwords in the international development field. They are cited very often, they are spoken about very often. Uh, there's a recent paper that puts them alongside the accountability and inclusion as forming a new consensus that would get you basically a job into any development agency if you put them all, if you say them all at once, basically. Um, and that's demonstrated by the fact that the last few years have seen a, a flurry of new initiatives, international initiatives that promotes the issue of transparency and participation in a number of disparate areas. So for example, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative looks at transparency in the natural resource sector. The International Aid Transparency Initiative promotes transparency in foreign aid. The Open Contracting uh, Partnership looks at transparency in government procurement and contracts. The Open Government Partnership also uh, is, is a broader initiative that looks at promoting openness, including transparency and participation in a number of uh, areas of uh, public sector action and public sector reform. You could argue that uh, all matters around transparency and participation have gathered pace and have become a lot more um, talked about and a lot more ubiquitous in international development discourse. Just very recently, both the International Monetary Fund and the OECD, the, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, have issued new directives, new guidelines, uh, uh, the IMF on fiscal transparency more specifically, the OECD on budgetary governance, and both of these tools include very specific recommendations and uh, very specific uh, uh, content around the need for budgets to be open, both in the sense of being transparent and publicly assess accessible, but also in the sense of creating opportunities for citizens and citizen organizations to be part of the process of decision making around how public resources are raised and spent. Something called the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency, which the IDP, the organization that I work for, uh, helped create a few years ago, um, put together something called the High Level Principles on Fiscal Transparency, Participation and Accountability, which were also endorsed by the UN General Assembly in December 2013. And these also state very clearly the right of citizens to access information and to uh, be part of decision making on, on budgetary matters. When it comes to participation, things have been a little bit more difficult. Many, especially within governments, there are many people who are not so keen on the idea of sort of letting citizens and civil society organizations into the policy making process. Uh, there's resistance. Many people say, well, it should really be parliaments as the people's representatives who keep an eye on what's happening with public resources or who sort of get to participate in the, in the budget making process. Uh, it shouldn't be citizens directly. And in the practice of participatory budgeting, you see how uh, citizen participation can make a difference, both in terms of deciding how resources are allocated, but also in improving the quality of government action and in delivering better public services. So the recent study that I, that I included in the written pack shows that in the municipalities in Brazil that use the participatory budgeting as a mechanism, uh, resources were allocated to priority sectors and out the development outcomes actually improved, looking at specifically at health, health indicators. So there's increasing evidence that, uh, that participation can, can make quite a, bit of, quite a bit of difference. Now, remaining a little bit on the, on the issue of evidence, uh, uh, you know, up to maybe uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there was hardly any evidence on how transparent governments were when it came to uh, public budgets. Uh, the IMF originally started something called uh, the, the Code of Good Practices on Fiscal Transparency in the late 90s, after the Asian financial crisis, and uh, started doing some assessments uh, based on this, on this code. Uh, on the basis of that, and also after the OECD published its early uh, best practices on budget transparency, which were published in 2002, the, the International Budget Partnership started uh, creating and uh, uh, implementing something called the Open Budget Survey, which was an independent survey done of budget transparency across the world, which has become one of the existing benchmarks in terms of at least making sure that data is publicly available on uh, comparing governments uh, both across countries and over time 
and see how they are actually doing on uh, uh, making budgets uh, transparent and open to public scrutiny. In a recent uh, piece of work that I did with a, with a colleague, we reviewed the whole literature around the impact of, uh, of fiscal openness, where we sort of include both transparency and participation, and we saw that the evidence overall comes out with some quite positive messages in terms of uh, budget transparency bringing better fiscal management in governments, but also improving issues around resource allocation and, uh, and service delivery, uh, to some extent um, improving uh, governance, levels of, uh, of governance in different countries, and in a more limited way contributing to better development outcomes. Again, this is quite a broad field, but overall the evidence points to some, uh, some, positive, uh, uh, some positive impacts of, of both transparency and participation. And then if you move to the participation side, often transparency is just not enough. If you're a government that sort of makes public inform makes information available on the budget, but then does not create any opportunity for dialogue between independent actors and government itself so that inputs can be received, proposals can be uh, independent, proposals can be assessed, uh, and different ways in which opinions can be um, sort of brought into the policy making process, then of course it's of little use to have information publicly available. So the idea is that a combination of transparency and participation is the best way to ensure that public resources will be uh, used effectively to promote the development. So if we want to measure uh, how transparent the budget is, there are a few different ways in which we can do it. The one in which the Open Budget Survey does it is basically to take eight key budget documents that all governments should make publicly available that cover the whole uh, a whole range of the different phases of the budget cycle. Uh, so they go from the pre-budget statement where a government sets out its general policy directions and, in, and its fis overall fiscal aggregates, to the budget proposal that the government puts together and sends to Parliament, to the budget law that is then approved by Parliament, budget execution reports that should come out uh, along the course of the fiscal year, and then reports that come out at the end, uh, after the end of the fiscal year, and are then sort of audited by the Supreme Audit Institution. So there is these eight key budget documents that we take and we measure uh, whether they are publicly available or not. So we check if they are put on government websites, if they are handed out as hard copy at the Ministry of Finance buildings or in Parliament, uh, disseminated through public libraries and other similar, th and other similar ways. Uh, and once we know that they are publicly available, then we check the level of detail that they include. So how detailed the information within the document is and, and how it allows different actors, so citizens themselves, but civil society organizations, the media, uh, even parliamentarians who often get sort of second-hand information on the budget from the executive, uh, if it allows them to carry out the analyses that they need in order to uh, keep hold the government accountable for what it does with public resources. So in one, in one of the readings that are included in the pack, we sort of try and uh, uh, disentangle a little bit the relationship between transparency, participation, and accountability. Because at the end of the day, what we really want to see come out of this process is governments being held accountable for, the, for, for how they use public resources. And in fact, what we found was uh, slightly disheartening, even though I'll say something about uh, some more positive cases, but that more and more governments are taking action on the transparency side, fewer of them are creating opportunities for participation, and even when those two pieces of the puzzle are taken together, uh, uh, the accountability side of things is even weaker, and there's even sort of fewer cases where we see a combination of transparency and participation leading to accountability. This is kind of on a more general level. We can then, however, drill down and there's a, there's a bunch of documented case studies that show how in specific cases uh, this combination can actually lead to very positive results. Some other important issues, for example, in, uh, in conflict, post-conflict countries is how to, um, how to sort of re-establish or recreate some kind of a social contract between the government and citizens. 
And usually transparency and participation are one way of, uh, again, there's, there's evidence that transparency and participation are ways of increasing the level of trust between citizens and governments, and in many ways also to ensure that citizen views are taken into account when governments are designing uh, policies and as a consequence of policies annual annual budgets. So uh, understanding what citizens' needs and priorities are and designing budgets in a way that responds to them is definitely something that can increase trust in government and that can improve the relationship between governments and citizens. There's a number of other, again, I sort of cited some of the evidence around the benefits that come in terms of improved development outcomes, and this is something, of course, that um, many governments are interested in. So using transparency and participation as one of the factors that can help the government improve service delivery and development outcomes is another interesting point that can and should be made uh, by reformers in countries in sort of difficult environments for where some of these reforms do not easily take place to try and convince government to, to adopt some of them and to uh, maybe slowly and gradually uh, making their budgets and their budget processes more open.